So this question of how long people want to live is really interesting. I've been writing about it in the uh, pages of our magazine, Zoomer magazine. Um, me, I'm curious, and uh, I, I can't imagine not wanting to stick around to find out how things turn out. And yet, you know, in our history and in our literature, the pursuit of extra long life is always presented as some kind of act of hubris. Um, you're familiar with uh, the myth of Dr. Faustus or, or uh, the picture of Dorian Gray as an example. And yet, and yet, we now have a moment in our history when this unusual combination of exponential technologies really aggressive and innovative researchers, entrepreneurs, all aligned with some very high-powered venture capital, think that they can bring all of that to bear and remove from human history the scourge of early death. So, Dr. Choka. Uh, Thank you very much, Moses and Connie and all the other organizers. I'm very uh, pleased to be here. Um, so I'm going to, this is sort of going along the same theme. Um, I believe that aging is ultimately understandable. I believe that ultimately it will also be reversible. Um, why, do, why do I say that? Well, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about philosophy. Um, you know, I'm kind of an amateur philosopher. There's, uh, there's a whole school of philosophy uh, called the New Mysterians, and these philosophers believe that there are some problems that are basically what they call cognitively closed to the human mind. So they basically believe that there are some things that we will never be able to figure out, uh, such as uh, where did the universe come from? Is there a God? What is the ultimate nature uh, of reality, the origin of consciousness, and so on? Like very, very deep problems, which they believe are essentially unsolvable because we're just not smart enough. And I think there's been a, tr a tendency to sort of put aging into that same category, whether it, it could be an unconscious feeling that, you know, it's just hopelessly complex, um, it's beyond us, um, and I just don't believe that that is so. Um, I think that we've crossed a threshold as a species where we can address not just aging, but even all those other problems, which I won't get into today, but I believe that they are also solvable um, but you have to go through uh, back in time and look at all of the great minds that have addressed these problems and put the pieces together. It's like building a jigsaw puzzle, and all these uh, answers are like scattered in space and time. But they, they are assembled, they, it's possible to assemble them into, into a complete picture. But as far as aging goes, um, I hit next, and... Uh, Somebody reboot that? <clears throat> okay. Yep. Why is it? Yeah, so, um, okay. There was, a, I'm going to go back well over 100 years, and I, I believe that to solve these problems, including aging, we, we need to take what, what I call a hyper-rational approach where you, you, you relentlessly apply rationality to problems until you arrive at a, an answer. And um, uh, August Weissman, uh, well over 100 years ago, took a kind of so-called hyper-rational approach, and he concluded that death takes place because worn-out tissues cannot forever renew themselves, and because a capacity for increase by means of cell division is not ever, everlasting but finite. So he believed that aging was fundamentally caused by the loss of the ability of cells to divide. <clears throat> Why did he say that? He realized he, he was also an evolutionary biologist, and he looked at different types of organisms, and he realized that there were two, there was like a, a very, very profound split during the evolution of life from, uh, from a uh, very simple organisms like Pandorina marum, in which all the cells were the same, to another type of organism, such as Volvox minor, in which you get a, a profound split in, in the cells. So you have the so-called somatic cells and the germ cells. 
And what happens is that the germ cells are maintaining life on this planet. So if you think about it, life has existed on Earth for billions of years. But uh, you know, each individual ages and dies. So the, the germ cells maintain life. And by germ cells, I mean the ovarian stem cells or spermatogonial stem cells produce each individual generation. But our individual somatic cells die. So each generation dies, but life is maintained in the germline. And in, so that, that was Weissman's basic idea. In, in, in modern biology, we can take that a little further and we realize that we have like certain types of stem cells in our bodies which can generate new cells, but not as effectively as the germ cells. So they're kind of like an intermediate step. And if, uh, if, the, if that program, if that germline program gets in, uh, reactivated improperly in a corrupt way, we can get like a cancer cell. And conversely, if the cells uh, stop dividing, we get a so-called senescent cell. And what that means is that the cells basically can no longer divide and they can't maintain the tissues anymore. So what we're trying to do now um, is to try and reverse those switches. So what, you know, can we, you know, if you, if you develop somatic cells from the germ cells, those cells eventually stop dividing in the body, can we take them back to the beginning? Can we take them back to the embryonic state and then make new, fresh cells from those embryonic cells? So we're, we're trying to understand what those pathways are. So you, like I said, you have this basic, very basic division between immortal germ cells and the somatic cells. So normally, um, you can't you can't go back to this state. So you can only make new, older cells. This isn't. Um, in regeneration, uh, like over there on the right hand side, there are certain animals which can sort of regenerate their cells. So one, one could say, well, if they can make new cells, then why are they aging? What, the reason is that they're making new cells only in a very narrowly defined space and time within their body. So if, they, if you injure the, the animal, it will take the cells backwards to an earlier form and then make new cells from it. But it doesn't do that continuously. It only does it in response to injury or, or some kind of wound. Um, <clears throat> okay. So, like I said, we have this basic split. Germ cells immortal, mortal cells die, somatic cells die. How do we figure out what the difference is between those cells? Like the DNA sequence isn't changing, so something is different between the cells in terms of the way they're behaving. Um, I've been studying a disease called progeria, or Hutchinson-Guilford progeria, which is a form of accelerated aging. So basically what happens is children with this disease, this is a mother and child with progeria, um, it's a single gene mutation but it results in very, very dramatically aged cells and tissues. You get atherosclerosis, so it doesn't, it doesn't just look like aging. You also have atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease, arthritis, muscular atrophy, age-looking skin, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, also, when you look at the cells in culture, you realize that they, div they don't divide well at all. So, it goes with that basic theory that you know, aging is primarily caused by a loss of cell division. If you take cells from a child with progeria, very difficult to grow them in culture. Um, so in order to figure out what those genes may be that are causing the aging in, in, in the children, we've done something called microarray experiments. And you can look, you know, you can analyze the cells and look for all the different types of gene expression changes between kids with progeria and kids without the mutation. And we found different types of genes altered, but it's very difficult to understand exactly what's going on there just by looking at the genes, a list of genes. So we've developed new types of software 
um, called pa pa uh, Pathway Activation Analysis, where the software takes all those gene expression changes and groups them into, into pathways that could be altered that are causing the, the accelerated aging of the cells. And that has like various types of advantages over just looking at the genes. So it, it makes more sort of intuitive sense when you look at the pathways and looking at the genes, it's, it's easier to understand. And this is just uh, like a graphical demonstration of the different types of gene expression changes that we found. I'm not going to dwell on this, the technical side of it. But what we found is that if you look at um, cells from a child with progeria, if you look at the pathways that are changed in those cells, and you compare them with uh, young cells, people, uh, you know, from young individuals, from middle-aged individuals, and from old individuals, the cells from a child with progeria actually cluster with middle-aged and old-age cells. So in terms of the pathways that are changed, um, they are essentially old cells. So not just at the visible macroscopic level, but at the, at the cellular level, you, you have accelerated aging. And uh, this is basically illustrating that point. Like a lot of the things that we see in uh, progeria, this is a child with progeria, this is a, an older person. A lot of this sort of types of molecular damage that we see in aging are recapitulated in progeria itself. So it's very, very similar to normal aging. So just to, to recapitulate what I said earlier and tying it back to Weissman that I mentioned at the beginning, um, it's important to understand uh, the difference between uh, cause and effect and how they relate to each other. So you may have heard that, for example, telomere damage causes aging, mitochondrial dysfunction causes aging, um, epigenetic changes cause aging. So there's, very, there's, there's actually a multitude of different types of damage that build up in the body, but they, I believe they don't actually cause what the visible signs of aging. So there's a link between the causes and the final effect, which is uh, loss of cell division itself. So they all lead to senescence. And that's the, the bridge, or what could be called the causal nexus between the multitude of effects and the final cause. So you, you have all these types of damage on the one hand, you have aging on the other, and the loss of cell division is the, is the bridge between them. <clears throat> and so, again, I borrowed this term from philosophy, it's called a causal nexus. You can have various types of damage, telomeres, cytoplasmic damage. Uh, aging is the final effect, but you go through that causal nexus of cells losing the ability to divide and causing a lot of uh, sort of collateral damage as well. So they start excreting proteins that damage other cells and so on. <clears throat> So it's sort of like the way I think about, the way I'm thinking about aging now, I sort of use this, this analogy of rotten apples. So you could, you could uh, have a basket of apples that look completely fine, you know, shiny red skin. <clears throat> and, um, you know, that's how I think about cells. So the cells are still dividing, you know, make the analogy with, you know, a young, healthy person. But if you, as long as the cells were still dividing, you could be accumulating damage inside the cells. It's like the, the apples are rotting from the inside. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't as long as the, your cells were still proliferating, you wouldn't actually appear to be old. So you would have a lot of damage within your cells, but because they're still dividing, you would be maintaining your, your macroscopic structure. So you wouldn't be visibly old. But um, eventually that damage would reach the surface, so to speak, and the cells would stop dividing, and then you would see the rotten apples. Um, so in theory, we could, we could sort of slow down or sort of extend lifespan by stimulating cell division. But it wouldn't be like, a, it, it wouldn't enable people to 
live forever, it would just probably give us another couple of decades because you're still accumulating that damage. So you could kind of mitigate it, you could make it invisible by stimulating the cells to divide, but you would sort of reach a critical point and then you would sort of age overnight, so to speak. Um, so, you know, we'd, we'd have to think about whether that's uh, morally uh, a good thing to do. And the way to do that is, uh, you know, there's, there's different ways to um, sort of take cells back to an earlier stage, the embryonic stage, where they're proliferating without end, where they have a form of cellular immortality. And there's like small molecules now that can do that. But we don't want to take the cells all the way back to an embryonic state because we, we, we don't want to turn into an embryo. Um, so what we really want to do is sort of rather than going back from an old differentiated cell all the way back to an embryonic, so this is like aging, cellular aging is on the x-axis here, and then the differentiation is here. We don't want to go diagonally all the way back to an embryonic cell where you reverse the, diff the so-called differentiation of a cell as well as the age. You just want to go along the axis alone where you reverse the age of the cell without changing the differentiation. <clears throat> and I believe if we can do that, we can understand these epigenetic changes, so-called epigenetic refers to gene expression changes, that radical life extension is possible just by forcing the cells to divide. Like I said, it wouldn't enable people to live forever because eventually that damage would become manifested. Um, to actually literally cure aging, we would have to, to block the damage or find ways to repair the damage. Um, but I believe that, that eventually that will be possible too, um, and we will be able to design drugs to activate pathways to repair the damage. And I'd like to acknowledge collaborators at Howard University um, in silico medicine and vision genomics. Thank you. Thank you.